So chances are you might know Golden Sun or maybe even played it yourself, or if not, at least heard of a bunch of other YouTubers talking about it, myself very much included, especially within the conversation of old Nintendo IPs that need to come back, but more often than not, it's brought up in a passing conversation sort of way with little description of what it actually is and has to offer. So what differentiates it from other RPGs and what's so special about it that I can't find anywhere else? So today I'd like to talk about that and maybe more importantly, what would a revival for Golden Sun look like today on the Nintendo Switch? Let's talk about it. As I alluded to in the intro, this video will essentially be comprised of two main sections. Firstly, what Golden Sun already is, or was, what it accomplished, where it shines, and generally what's unique about it. And in case you're wondering why we're talking about this specific RPG series when there's plenty of old and new RPG series is out today, let me try to pique your interest. Now, I'm aware that I'm not familiar with every game series out there, and even the ones I do know of, I haven't played all of their games. So when trying to look for another game like like Golden Sun, I took to the trusty internet and I asked in various ways if beyond my own knowledge there are any other RPG series that fill a similar role and have similar mechanics to Golden Sun and got back a resounding no. Actually when Octopath Traveler launched there was a whole bunch of talk about whether this would be the kind of spiritual successor of Golden Sun and it was a great game but it wasn't that. All that to say that these games are loved not only for what they are but also for what they do. So, to contextualize the games for a moment, the original two Game Boy Advance games, Golden Sun and Golden Sun The Lost Age, were actually meant to be just one game at initial development and originally intended for the Nintendo 64, which may explain the large scope of the game, especially compared to other handheld games of the time. In the end, it did have to be split up into two games, but at the end of the first game, you get a code that you could enter into The Lost Age, which will allow you to carry over some character and item progression when the time comes. Also, these first two games were really well received in their time and launched early enough on the Game Boy Advance lifespan that it became an instant classic for that console. But what I'm most interested in talking about for this part is what's so unique about Golden Sun. To me, one of the most significant features is the implementation of overworld puzzles, which certainly isn't unique in and of itself, but is pretty rare to find in this way in a turn-based RPG. Basically, think Zelda-type puzzles, but with their own variety and twists. Whereas Zelda puzzles are generally tied to items you find and earn along the way, the puzzles here are related to spells, also called synergy. For example, to move an item from far away, to create an ice pillar out of a puddle, to make a plant grow creating a vine ladder, or all sorts of other things. So just on this combination, Golden Sun basically stands alone as a turn-based RPG to have this kind of emphasis on puzzles. But not only that, the puzzles are also intrinsic to the game design. And in some ways, these abilities resemble HMs in Pokemon, as like Pokemon attacks, a lot of synergy is battle use only, but similar to HMs, some have overworld functionality as well. Like growth creates a vine ladder from a sapling in the overworld, but in battle is also a low level earth attack. Others are overworld use only, like catch, tremor, or read mind, but there are a lot of them. And as far as functionality, these all cost synergy points, which are automatically replenished by walking around, and there are some skills tied to a specific party member, but others that can be given to a party member by assigning different djinn to them. Which brings us to another important aspect of Golden Sun, the djinn. These are collectible creatures that you assign to various party members. And when I say collectible, it's not in a similar way to Pokemon where you collect any creature you fight, but rather the djinn are progressively out of the way and challenging to find and often can be overlooked completely, sometimes without the ability to go back and get them. In the first game, there are seven djinn of each of the four elements. Once on your team, you can equip them to different party members which will affect their stats, abilities, and roles in your party. This does a really good job, in my opinion, to decide whether you want more well-rounded but slightly weaker characters or lean into their strengths and min-max but lead a slightly riskier playthrough. This is also something I really appreciate about the weapons. Outside of a few super rare weapons, most of them aren't objectively the best choice, but rather allow you for the same kind of decision to min max or not. Some are even cursed, but have great stats, which is great and lots of fun. 
And the last thing on the Jin is the way they use them is a super cool mechanic. You can either have them activated or not activated, and in one state they buff your stats and give you more abilities, but in the other state they can be summoned as some huge attacks. And during longer battles, you can have them switch back and forth between these two states. There's more nuance to it than that, but needless to say, they're really awesome. Okay, so I really want to get to the second half of this conversation, so I'm just going to make some honorable mentions really quick of other features in the games. So firstly, I really appreciate that these games have towns that have really cool secrets, including the overworld puzzles from before, and several of them have mini games that are really fun. It's kind of like how fans of Final Fantasy VIII love Triple Triad. I really love the mini games in Golden Sun Towns. Also, within these towns, there are a lot of NPCs, and there are two things about how Camelot handled these that I really enjoy. The first is how read mind works. This is synergy that allows you to read the mind of anyone, and it gives a whole deeper layer to the games that I really appreciate. Some of the reading minds could be helpful information for the main quest, whereas others could be silly stuff or secrets or whatever. But the other way that they deal with NPCs is the inclusion of reactions. Basically, RPGs have two different ways of dealing with dialogue paths on two extremes, uh, both of which I played a game for last holiday. Divinity Original Sin 2 and Pokemon Sword and Shield. In Divinity, the conversation choices have a lot of weight. Depending on what you say, that person could become a friend or foe permanently. At best, they temporarily join my team and fight alongside me, or at worst, they and the whole tavern attack me. But on the other end of the spectrum, you've got dialogue paths like Pokemon Sword and Shield, where someone could ask like, hey, is Cinnamon Toast Crunch good, or do you like bagels? And if I say, I like bagels, then they'll be like, yeah, bagels and Cinnamon Toast, they're pretty good. Obviously showing that whatever you answered wouldn't change a single thing. And in my opinion, Golden Sun does a good middle ground of this, where it's not as high stakes as Divinity is, but it does feel like oftentimes the conversation decisions you make have value. You can get a secret ending in the first game by just saying, no, I don't want to save the world right at the beginning, and it ends the game. <laughs> so overall, there is more to Golden Sun than just those features, but I think those are the ones that really stand out and make Golden Sun more unique. Also, the soundtracks are really good. But now what? Golden Sun's gone. There were those two GBA games, one in 2001, the other in 2002, and then Golden Sun took a long hiatus until it came back right at the end of the DS life cycle in 2010, which was pretty poor timing, honestly. And frankly, I don't know if it's ever gonna come back, but for the reasons above and a lot of others, I really hope it does. And this is probably the time that I should tell you that despite playing and replaying and loving the first two games, I never actually got around to playing Dark Dawn. If you're a subscriber here, you probably know that I fell out of gaming for a little while and only came back around when the Switch came out. Speaking of subscribers, uh, if you're not a subscriber, go ahead and subscribe. That would be a good way for you to keep up with this content, ring the bell for notifications so you can get all that stuff. I didn't mean to plug that really, but it seems like a fitting time. But yeah, I fell out of gaming and didn't realize Dark Dawn was a thing. And then at this point, I'm kind of just trying to keep up with games as they're coming out. So haven't gone back to play it yet. And the mixed reviews kind of makes it a little bit harder to want to go back, but I still should. And I really want to. But that's important to say that some of my thoughts for what a new Golden Sun could look like might have already been addressed in Golden Sun Dark Dawn. So if you've played that game or if you're a Golden Sun super fan, do be sure to let me know in the comments actually what things happened that I'm not aware of. So imagining this revival of Golden Sun, I think the first question that sets the groundwork for everything is scope. And honestly, this is a really hard question to tackle. Uh, first of all, I would assume that Camelot would be the one making this game since they made the other ones. But would they approach this new title as a self-contained handheld experience or lean into the power of the system, which is arguably what they did with the other titles? The GBA titles may look dated now, but they looked really good for the time. It's hard to say, especially considering the franchise has been absent for so long, going for a big budget game may be too risky of a move. I'd want to compare it to Fire Emblem, which recently transitioned into the home console game Fire Emblem Three Houses, but the difference there is there have been a lot of those titles and they've had recent ramping success, so investing more money and time into a new Fire Emblem game isn't all that risky, even getting Koei Tecmo involved on some of the development work. And if they did go the big budget route, I think Mon 
want Liftsoft to be a good team to help support them in that process. But I don't actually think that's what they would do considering the risks. So let's play it safe for this conversation. But if you guys are interested enough, I'd happily make another video on Golden Sun with a huge scope. Just kind of depends on how much you like this video. And one question I have considering the smaller scope is could Nintendo charge $60 for it? And I have two answers to that question. The first one is I made a video two weeks ago on pricing of games and market and all that kind of stuff. So check that out if you want. And the answer is yes, they could. But the second one is actually Octopath Traveler, which we talked about at the top of the video, uh, but that's a great precedent set that something like that a uh, JRPG with kind of pixel art graphics could still do great and be worth $60 for most people that actually care about it. And the major point in favor of keeping this kind of top-down grid-based approach to this RPG is actually that it serves the core of the game a little bit better, which is those puzzles. Sure, the puzzles could be done in a 3D world kind of environment, but we'd kind of be starting from scratch rather than growing off of the foundation of what we already have in the older games. And without a huge production budget as possible, that those would fall kind of flat and be a weak point where they are a really strong point right now. And in mentioning the art style as before, I think actually going the Octopath Traveler 2D HD route might be best. Everyone was comparing it to that in the first place, so that's obviously something that rings a bell to us, so it could mesh together really nicely. And that would be for the overworld and the town and puzzles and all that kind of stuff, but then the battles would have more fleshed out, beautiful graphics, which is kind of already what the games have been doing in the first place, so this would just be a grander version of that. But maybe something that wasn't so grand was the story of Dark Dawn. It's a sequel of the first two games, taking place 30 years afterwards in the same world, but randomly with a new old civilization that popped up and everybody was like, why is that there? And it's some of the children of the main characters with kind of some character archetypes left over from the other ones. So if a fourth game were to come out, it could certainly wriggle its way into the current narrative that's already there, but probably what would be better, and uh, maybe not everyone would like this, but going the Final Fantasy or Bravely Default 2 route, where it's the same world, same mechanics, same core concepts, but a new story. I mean, you could do some kind of prequel like the way beginning of the universe sort of thing, or you really could just do a whole new story. I think the things that make Golden Sun, Golden Sun are more the other stuff that we talked about. The characters are great, but they don't necessarily have a whole lot more to say. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 did, was a good example of this as well, where it's related to Xenoblade Chronicles. It's the same overall world, but there's only little bits and pieces that tie them together. Generally, they're pretty separate. I honestly think as long as the core elements are still there, the puzzles, the turn-based combat, the gin, the dialogue options, the rest can kind of just fall in place. So the surprising thing to me as I end this video is I don't think it would be as hard to bring back Golden Sun as I'd initially thought. As I was first thinking about this topic, I imagined that it would have to be this huge sprawling RPG to feel like something that's worthy of the 10 year gap that's happened. But honestly, I don't think that's the case anymore. I think Nintendo at least would see that as too risky and probably just wouldn't happen. But if they knew that people would accept and love something more like this, I think they'd be more likely to do it. It would be a safe alternative that would honestly turn out great. And as one last thought, this is kind of Nintendo's only game of this exact ilk. They have a bunch of RPGs and they have a bunch of fantasy games like Fire Emblem, Zelda, Xenoblade, etc., etc. But this is pretty much their only fantasy turn-based RPG. So it's got a unique spot that needs to be filled. But that's what I think. What do you think? Do you think Golden Sun should come back? Let me know all that and more in the comment section down below. And a quick shout out too. The gameplay footage from Golden Sun is from a channel, Luigi Advance, who does uh, Let's Play. So go ahead and check that channel out. But yeah, let me know all that more in the comment section down below. Go check out that channel. There's a whole bunch of other Golden Sun stuff on the internet too. And then be sure to subscribe to Fanatics 4 and like the video for more videos like this every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Even during, you know, crazy world stuff going on. But I appreciate your time. And if you would, share this video with a friend who'd be interested in Golden Sun or is just really bored because it's crazy. Like I said, it's crazy out there. All right, that's it for me. Bye.